and it's 5.01. I'll call this Zoom meeting to order. And the first order of business is to review the minutes from the meeting on March 22nd. Yep. And you have it in your packet. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve them. I'll or second. Thank you, Donna. Yep. Byron, do you see you see it in your packet? Yes. Okay. Everybody ready for a motion which has been made to approve the minutes as circulated? Yep. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Do we have any resident and citizen to participate? Nobody outside the board? Okay. Um, the next very important business, even though we kind of did it last month, is to welcome Alicia Underwood. Yes. To our board. <laughs> Indeed. Welcome. Yes. Happy to be here. And as I said earlier, but some people didn't hear it, how much I appreciated her op-ed piece on childcare in, the, in Wyndham County to enable people who are working to plan to have children. So uh, she did a good job. Thank you. The next piece is strategic planning. You'll see the uh, request for proposal issued April 27th, date, due date May 17th um, for a um, facilitator to launch the strategic planning process. Yeah, I think, should, hmm? I think we should do this. So this is the request for proposal and we are doing it for the next five years. So this is really important. And so was there anything that I left out of this or anything that you would want me to modify before I put this out to see if we get we receive any offers? I think it's well written. Yes. Yeah, I thought it was pretty clear. Great. I had two thoughts about it. Uh, one is whether four to six hours a week is enough for four weeks. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, I think it would be, it may be that we need a little bit more. That was sort of where I was starting. Is that something that uh, can fluctuate? Um, it could. The idea would be um, potentially, you know, some weeks would need a little less, some weeks we may need a little bit more. You know, I think that in the planning phase, we'll probably need um, a little bit more. And then the, I'm hoping that the person can put the notes together and then and then help us. But it might, it, I think it might continue to be four to six hours per week, but it might be longer than four weeks. Uh -huh. That's something we could negotiate during the time as needed. Yes, uh -huh. I, I believe so. I, I would ask that when we put this out, but maybe, I mean, I'm happy to do, do you feel like I should add to it um, four to six weeks instead of four weeks? Or something, something, Christine, that says uh, something about flexibility to, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. you know, increase, you know, or however you want to word it, but maybe the word flexibility. Okay. So. And not limit it to only four weeks. Okay. Right. Estimated four weeks, but flexible according to need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds good. Okay. I mean, you don't know, we could do it in, uh, uh, you know, one week might be three hours and the next week might be five hours, yeah. you know, yeah. you, know you, you don't yeah. know, it kind of depends on mm -hmm. what's on the agenda. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it depends on also how fast, 
you know, this person's going to need to meet with um, the community, the residents, the board, and the staff. And so four separate groups. And so, you know, I don't know how fast they want to do that. They might want to do them all at one, you know, within two weeks, they might want to spread it out. I'm not sure, but I, I will definitely add flexibility. I think that would be needed. I just don't want to drag it out too long either. I'm afraid I will get someone who would be like, well, I can commit to two hours a week for like three months <laughs> and that's not going to work. But if, but if, we, if they can commit to four to six hours for maybe four to six weeks, that would be great. But I will definitely add the flexibility piece. Because my fear is, is that we're going to have a hard time finding somebody. So I think you're right. I think it makes more sense to be more flexible than less. Do we want to state a particular work product? You do say draft a plan with appropriate metrics. Mm -hmm. Is there something more that needs to be said? You know, I think that that's something that we would develop once we per once the person we have the person. I mean, that was just my thought that that would be, you know, the, the initial piece would be meeting with the board for to decide of how, what we want the finished product to look like. So would the word like pre-approve or be more appropriate than appropriate? Like so that they know that it will be approved by us. And um, also I've seen in other, um, proposals that with that flexibility clause that um, it's it's common language. So I, I've seen it like groundworks position that it may hours may vary from week to week. It could be mm. more, it could be less. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I had a question, Christine, is this four to six hours? Is that inclusive of the whole organization, including the board? Like, would they spend an hour a week with, I don't know, administration, let's say, and is it separated like that? Or is this strictly just board? No, this would be separated. And so I think the expectation would be they would meet with Janet and myself to start out and, and then maybe meet with the whole board um, for one meeting to just figure out how we want to go forward. And then when the meet, when the board does your piece where you where you do your actually strategic planning piece, that will be separate from when they meet with the with the staff, the community, and the residents. We can certainly have a board so member this... attend those meetings, but it wouldn't mean that you all as a group had to be committed to all of that time. Was that the intent of your question, Donna? Yeah, because I was just, I was like, is this all board or is this include like, you know, organization wide, I guess was my question. So yeah, okay, that makes sense. My understanding is that it's organization wide. And I find myself thinking, hmm, I would like to meet as a board with the facilitator after the facilitator has met with the other groups. Right. Here what they have to say and have to reflect our view uh, based on those reflections. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Christine, do you okay. need um, formal approval from us? Or this is our thoughts just enough? No, I think your thoughts are enough. I just want to make sure that I got that lap. There's one point that I missed with Alicia in terms of draft a plan with appropriate metrics. You had, you said something different besides appropriate. Did you say board approved? Yeah, board approved. I wonder, have you seen useful elsewhere is in addition to drafting a formal plan. Um, if we could ask for a perhaps confidential memo to the board with the facilitators, just observations and reflections about us and what we're up to uh, is, their sort of personal thoughts that they think might be useful that don't necessarily go in a formal plan.
in a sense, uh, assessing the emotional content of the process we're going through? Is that what you are looking at, Byron? I'm sorry. I Let didn't... me try it again. Uh, is, are you asking basically for uh, the, the quality and the emotional content of the work either the board or the whole organization is doing together? Is this directed to the board or is it directed to the entire Brattleboro Housing Partnerships? Directed only to the board, but including whatever miscellaneous thoughts they may have that don't really fit in a formal plan. I see. That, that might be appreciated. Okay, so um, so in addition to drafting a formal plan, uh, a memo to the board with their observations yeah. or comments. How about the word comments? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Other things that have occurred to them in the course of this exercise. Okay. Something to that effect. Are we ready to move on? Yeah. The COVID 19 update. I don't think there is a um, sheet on it. No, I didn't see one either. What are you looking for? I'm sorry. The COVID-19 update. No, there's no paper. I was just going to let you, um, that was just my report out of COVID-19. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to let you know that as of today, we are following the same guidance as the state. So we have changed our policy. So, so if people travel out of state, they no longer have to quarantine for seven days. Mm -hmm. They have to quarantine for three days um, if they're not fully vaccinated. And then submit a negative um, test result. Okay. Um, but we're following all other guidelines around, we're continuing to disinfect all the buildings, continuing to wear proper uh, masks and follow all the safety protocols we've continued to follow. But that was the only change up to date. And, okay. um, and the other, other piece, you know, because this changes every day. Um, so I am meeting with our HUD um, representative from Vermont tomorrow morning and he because I've been really trying to press the Department of Health to offer clinics at our housing sites mm -hmm. and I have not gotten very far <laughs> um, you know I've sent them lots of data I've sent them lots of information um, the number of people and we just haven't we haven't you know I think that they haven't been able to as of any of the other housing sites around the state have not been able to offer these and so we are, um, so HUD has contacted me and I think that they are trying to set up a clinic and I'm hopeful that it would be at our family sites because I think that's where we have seen the least, um, you know, the least amount of people receiving the vaccine. So we'll, I will let you know how that goes. Do you have any information on the percentages of people who've been vaccinated? We only have, um, we only have really what our, um, you know, the SASH statistics mm -hmm. and of the people that they work with, it varies at one housing site at Red Clover Commons, it's high, it's about 70% at the Sam Elliott Apartments and Hayes Court, it's lower. Um, and that could be due to access. There's less, you know, it's harder to get to appointments. And so if we were to offer it at that site, I'm hopeful that we would be able to increase the numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments, questions? Sure. We'll move on to retirement. Uh, Attorney Pat Bell's retirement as of the uh, Friday of this week. And um, Christine, you want to talk a little bit about the new attorney who's been chosen to work? Yes, yeah, so Pat, um, Pat let us know uh, March 1st that she would be retiring as of May 1st. And so we have been working with her to close out files. She recommended a few names. One of them was Nadine. Um, Nadine had worked 
previously with Courtney D'Onofrio, our property manager on cases um, at a prior place of employment when she worked for another organization, another low income housing organization. And so we did meet with her. Um, we received references from other housing authorities. She works with uh, Burlington Housing Authority, Rutland Housing Authority, Springfield Housing Authority. She's a pretty big operation. She primarily um, only does housing. And so she really understands housing policies, HUD policies specifically inside and out. She also works with Vermont State Housing Authority. So um, she worked in, you know, she worked closely with them as they, you know, to offer guidance around the rental subsidy program for the COVID CARES funding. And so, um, so I think that, you know, after really meeting with her and getting references from other people, we decided she was by far our best bet. She really understands housing. Um, the other people that we, we looked at were, um, you know, they just didn't, they might have worked with other housing providers, but they didn't really understand HUD, you know, public housing the way that we, we operate. It's a little different. And so um, I think that she um, will be a really good resource for us. So I'm excited. We're certainly in good company, given the list of all the places she's worked with. Yeah, and and Pat was lovely, you know. And I love, you know, we were really lucky to work with Pat. She was local. She knew us inside and out. She worked with us for so long. Um, I'm I'm you know happy that she's going to retire. You know, we all met with her on Friday as a staff and to say you know good luck and goodbye. She really deserves a great retirement. She's worked really hard. But I think that this would be, this for us is the next step. And we, and we can reevaluate in a year and see if it works, but I wouldn't want to just, I wanted to get someone who is really seasoned. Um, and, and I think that she, you know, I think Nadine is definitely very seasoned and she has a big group of people working for her. So. Can we afford her? She's a little bit more expensive, um, but I think that she, but I think that Pat was actually very inexpensive. <laughs> so I think that we were getting a deal for a really long time. I think that Nadine's rates are, they're, you know, they're comparable to what we pay for our labor attorney. They're comparable to what we pay for our retirement attorney, you know, so I think that, um, and, I, and, you know, I'm pretty hopeful that our time will be really streamlined. You know, she really knows what we're doing she probably won't be dealing with a lot of cases that she hasn't dealt with before. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds very good. I will miss Pat. I know I've known her for a long time in various situations and she's a great gal and what a, what a wonderful referral. Right. I would so like to suggest yeah. that as a board, we send Pat appreciation for all she has done with us and for us and wishes for a good retirement. Absolutely. Other members of the board feel that? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yep. So may I work out on your behalf a letter with Christine to Pat? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do that and I'll sign it on behalf of the entire board. Please do. Great. Okay. Yes. And you may have seen um, in Lucy's report, but not in Jack's, I, I was surprised when I read it um, that he didn't mention it as well, but both Lucy and Jack have resigned from their positions. Lucy resigned as of, she gave us a three week notice, which was as of last Friday. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be hiring for the FSS position. And Jack resigned um, as of this Friday because he does not want to come back to the Bradbury area. He wants to stay. He lives up outside of Boston. And so he wants to stay in that area. Um, he doesn't want to commute back and forth the way he had been doing for eight years. And so I don't blame him at all. Um, but we really do you know, need somebody in his position to be on site. And so um, it was really difficult. I, I really, you know, I felt like we tried really hard over the past year to allow him to work remotely, but it just became really hard to not have him in Brattleboro. Well, it remotely was required by uh, COVID, but mm -hmm. would need to come back and I can understand. Um, as, a, as a board, perhaps we have three, two more letters to write with appreciation yes. for both um, uh, Lucy. Is Jack and done? Is his last day this Friday? This is the 30th. So like the transition piece of him training somebody else 
I mean, he leaves it, all that information that he has about the new projects and all of that. Is, are we going to be able to? Yeah. So we have been, so I have been working with him for the past month on this process. So we, we created a plan of how he would transition out and we have been working on that. Okay. We have given some of his assignments. So he was super, you know, in his job description, he was supposed to be the supervisor of maintenance as well as property management. He had transitioned out of um, out of supervising property management before I came on as an AD, and he was supervising maintenance, which was he wasn't able to do remotely. And so we hired David Dearborn, and so that was a big piece of his job. The other pieces of his job, for sure, will be hard to cover. Chris Hart is going to continue to cover the project. She had been really stepping in more to cover the project mm -hmm. for RCC2 and the Melrose work because Jack wasn't able to be on site for this past year. So she had been already committed to many of those pieces. And, um, and he did agree to help in the transition when we hire someone else. Uh, you know, I think once we talked to um, James, especially in an executive um, session and we discuss um, the budget, I think you'll see that we have some room to be a little bit more creative. I think his position had really evolved over time. And, and in this past year, we've had to really allocate a lot of work to other people within the organization. Okay. So appropriate. The next thing, the staff reports review, property portfolio manager. Purple. Any questions? Nope. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Are we on the yellow sheet? We're on the, the purple sheet. So in terms of RCC2, um, I think Jack must have written, he wrote this prior to this. Um, so we, um, Chris Hart and I actually worked with them on the uh, communication around the water line. They actually had to shut down the entire street and we needed to shut down the entire driveway for that period. So we were in direct communication with the residents on a daily basis to make sure that they were aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And it's been done and uh, is completed successfully. I remember... <laughs> Driving. The waterline is completed. They're continuing to do some work, but the driveway has been, they haven't repaved it yet. They're, they still need to repave the driveway once they're completed. And drywall installation, has it begun? It has begun, yes. And uh, Christine, are we advertising for Jack's position or we, what is your... We are, gonna, we are going to advertise starting this week. We have a position advertising, but I think that position, uh, you know, we, we really had to dig in and do some research to make sure that we were hiring for the right position. His position was um, a pretty big position for the organization and pretty, it was compensated in the same way. And so I think that we really need to look at what the job duties are that are not being done. The yellow sheet, the um, property managers. So the vacancies that uh, are mentioned there, have they been filled? The uh, three vacant units at Red Clover Commons with two applicants pending approval. And uh, A.W. Richards have a vacancy come available at the end of March. So A.W. Richards is full as of now. Um, RCC too, um, we, had a, we had a situation that came up that it was just a last minute change of plans for a person that we were moving, that we were thinking was gonna move in. And mm -hmm. so that changed, but we will be, um, we do have two applications pending. So it just sort of put, it, it definitely, it just put things a little bit behind, one month behind. So, okay. but we have people lined up to be moving into RCC. Great. And the rent collection. 
I see there's the note about the recertification at Richards. Um, is there a plan to loosen the schedule for recertification? I don't think so, no. The I mean, this, this, so this, so, um, so just so I, I know, so we, these, um, the reports are sent to me. So this report that I mailed out to you on the 19th is submitted to me by the 16th. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at a report, you're looking at it almost usually 10 days behind. We like to get the report 10 days ahead of time so that I can put them together, Janet, Janet and I can meet and do the agenda. And so when she drafted this, this might've seemed like, you know, she was probably like, oh, this is coming up, but they've been working on the recertifications for probably two months. <clears throat> my, my thought was, I thought that under, um, Red, we were going to be able to not recertify as regularly. As Under often. the moving to work program, we will, but we haven't um, we haven't committed to the moving to work program yet. We we've, we've got approved by HUD, but last meeting the board decided that they wanted to wait to adapt the amendment. We'll review the materials that I sent you. You wanted to wait to adapt the amendment until the end of August. But even though that's being said, we still will need to do the recertifications at AWR because it's a tax credit building. It's not under the, it's not a public, it's not under the HUD guidelines. And so we can change the recertification timeline for the, the RAD projects, which are um, Hayes Court, Samuel L.A. Departments, Ledgewood Heights, and Moore Court. But AWR has a different requirement. And so okay. their tax, it's a tax credit building. So we would need to continue to do that yearly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. As any money comes through for uh, delinquent uh, rental assistance, I know we talked about that possibility. Uh, some, however, many of the people that we work with do not qualify for the program, many of the people that we house. You need to be able to sh show that you've lost income in the last year. And so um, we will have some people that will qualify, but many of our residents haven't, their income hasn't changed. Unfortunately. It is really unfortunate. It's really a shame. It's too bad. No. Any more comments on that? We'll move on to uh, resident wellness and services, FSS, SASH, and SASH coordinators, uh, the monthly report, which I found very interesting on the communication. How people like to um, be contacted. How has Evernorth Connections, in partnership with Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, um, which has just completed its second round of long-term survey project, better understand low-income uh, low households, how has it been working with them, Christine? Good. I think um, they're going to join the RAC board, or they probably did today because the meeting was today, to mm -hmm. talk to them a little bit about the research they're doing. They're, they're working with um, housing sites all over the state mm -hmm. um, and not just tax credit properties. That's primarily what they work with, but they're also, you know, they've asked us to also survey our public housing properties, which has been helpful. So I think they're really trying to get a better picture of where people are, um, you know, how many people are losing income. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it varies greatly depending on, on what type of property it is. 
but how are they to work with when they're coming through in surveys? Are, are residents cooperative with them? They are, and I and I and I'm not sure if Lorelai outlined this, but we were doing some of the work ourselves. We were working with residents to start with, and then they were following up. And I think our residents have been very responsive. I think they've done a great job of of responding. So I think I think they've identified a good group that feels comfortable sharing information. That's great. Any other questions from the board? So move on to. Um, I just wanted to say I, I thought it was interesting, Janet. Um, depending on the location <clears throat> and whether or not they were, you know, tech savvy versus wanting a phone call versus didn't want email, you know, I thought that was interesting. Yes, indeed. It was really helpful. You know, when this started, we thought a lot about how, you know, I think we started the robocalls as a response to COVID, but I think that we would always use them at this point. I think they're really effective. Um, but it was helpful to hear because, you know, we would, we would only get negative feedback. Um, you know, we would only get feedback, like, I don't like this. So we didn't know who, what, what other people liked, and we didn't want to base our decision on how we were going to communicate with our residents just based on negative reports. So we got a lot of responses. I don't know if Lorelai identified how many responses they got, but they got an incredible amount of responses. We've never gotten that many responses back from any surveys. So it was a lot, a lot of information. I don't think, as I went through it, I don't think I saw the number. Yeah, I'll have to ask her to get that. I was really surprised by all the people that have landlines still. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah really. <clears throat> well, landlines seem to be important for those who are using medical monitors. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Sash, Shona Ba has the report. He's talking about a March 1st, gentle opening date now in place now of, to open the rooms. This is community rooms. Where are you, Janet? On the next page. Oh. That's a support and service of the home SASH implementation management. Oh, okay. And then Oh, you also have the family self-sufficiency report after that, but I thought we would do the, the uh, SASH report first. They're doing yearly reassessments for participants, uh, which includes the SASH waiver, use and disclosure, and the UCLA and Lubin. What's, what's the Lubin screenings? I believe that that's around, um, I don't know if you know, Alicia, offhand, I can't remember. I remember I had to do it for SASH. I want to say it's the, it's the isolation or it's the depression. I know it's one connected to mental health. Let me, I can probably Google it. The next, next sentence says these screenings focus, focus on depression and isolation, which are important to help determine how best to support our participants, whether it be through one-to-one -one interaction or group programming. These trainings are also used for grant writing and funding purchase purposes for SASH program. Yeah, this the Lubin is a social network scale. Uh, okay. So how many people that you connect with, how many people you talk with today, how many, you know, that's how they assess. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have a, the report after this from the, uh, Jake Bursky, who is the SASH coordinator. Are we advertising for another um, RN? Yes, we've been advertising for quite some time. And I've met with uh, the hospital um, to see if they could potentially um, work with us to have a nurse. And we, so we've met once and we're gonna meet again, hopefully we'll be this week to give us some information. We've been advertising, it's really hard to, I mean, we have not gotten a lot of applications. Hmm. 
of that. So I would like to contract with the nurse because with the hospital specifically because they work so closely with the community health team already. I think it would really align. And so I met with Rebecca Burns, who's the head of the community health team. Um, and she was bringing it to her, I think Jody, who's like the next person up maybe. <laughs> and then um, and then they're supposed to come back to me, but they really want to be able to provide it as well. And so I think that would be I think that would be great. I mean, we've been very lucky to have contracted nurses, um, but it's, but right now there's such a, I, I don't know if there's just such a high demand or we're just not getting the responses. When I've hired in the past, we, we had a lot of to choose from and we just don't at this point. So if we contract with the would hospital, it be we won't get the same person each time? No, we would, we would. They offer a nurse for Groundworks as well. And I think because we are also looking at expanding our SASH program to include family SASH. And so when we're having those conversations, I think they were hoping that maybe it could be a full-time position. Okay. Donna, you had a question? Yeah, um, this maybe before or after I should bring it up. Um, the proposal for funding to offer our family services, family sites partner with Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust but each have our own program. You know, this is for SASH, uh, but, and they would not oversee the BHP program. So how do you have a joint SASH um, person and then have two separate programs? It would be two separate coordinators. Okay. Is that your question? I, I just, it was confusing to me. Yeah, I'm not sure how, let me, let me see how she wrote it. It probably makes sense to me just because I know. Proposal um, for funding to offer to our family sites, partner with Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, but each have our own program. Uh, Wyndham and Windsor would, wouldn't be overseeing the BHP program. Yes, it would be two, two separate programs. So two separate SASH family site panels. Okay. So each would have a coordinator, each would have a part-time nurse, and each would have a part-time mental health clinician. Okay. So that so that partnering by with Wyndham Windsor, I think that Shada, you know, I think that what she was trying to say is, is that we, we as the work because we're the designated regional housing organization for the SASH program. Okay. So we Got oversee it. panels throughout. Wyndham and Windsor County. So we oversee panels in Upper Valley and White River Junction, Springfield, right. um, Townsend, the two panels here in Mount of Scutney. And so we partner with several other organizations. So we will continue to work with them to partner with them. However, they will have their own panel. Yeah, okay. So um, that's not in place yet, certainly. It's not in place yet. We haven't received the funding yet, although it feels like the momentum is starting. <laughs> so we're beginning to we're beginning to meet. I'm meeting tomorrow with Elizabeth Bridgewater and their, I can't remember what his title is. It's a, um, I think it started as a uh, social service, you know, supervisor that's fine. That's fine. and Lorelai and so we're we're talking about it community engagement right. but we're already you know they're already getting sash in cathedral square is already starting to get ear, you know proposals for earmarks to have this pilot project here right. so so again we'll have to hire for that position as well we would have to hire the coordinator but hopefully we'd be able to work with the hospital and hcrs to provide those other two positions okay great okay so would the hospital and ACRS be like the fiscal agent for those two positions? They they would. They would probably bill BHP and then we would they would they would bill us and then we would send it directly to them. Okay. We wouldn't pay those positions directly. Right. If this is the way it worked out. <laughs> Again, so, it's it's always varies. We used to have the VNA used to provide the nurse. And they did that for years and then that stopped that they weren't able to provide the nurse any longer and that's when we shifted to hiring them as a contracted nurse mm -hmm. so that their own entity they're not bhp employees they we hire them as a contract and that has been great however it seems like as we're trying to hire another contracted nurse we're, we're not having as much luck as we did in the past and so we have been trying to work with you know, we've reached out to the VNA as well, but they don't have the staff at this point in Bayada. But it seems like the hospital might be in a better position to offer that position. Yeah. 
So they would have um, BMH like benefits and um, that whole package, a full-time package. Yes, which would probably, um, you know, we were able to boost our hours because we were contracting. So we were able to, to pay it at, when we were paying for the VNA, we were paying at a $50 an hour rate. When we were paying our contracted employee, we were paying $37.50. So we were able to increase from 15 to 20 hours a week. So when I met with Rebecca Burns, we discussed how much we have. You know, we basically have seven hundred fifty dollars a week for the two panels that we currently have. the 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 family sash program will be different. There's different pay rates and different allocations. Okay. Okay. We're ready to move on. Yep. Family self sufficiency, and this is Lucy tells. Um, talking about leaving her position on April 23rd, which has passed. And uh, the escrow letters that went out at the end of March, they're quite remarkable. Uh, monthly deposits rating ranging from 171 to $538 and total balances ranging from $16.09 to $6,787.94. So uh, we hope that this will give some participants a real hand leg up as they graduate from the program. And in the time being, um, David DeAngelis. Um, so David DeAngelis has always done the escrow portion and worked with Billy Joe and, and um, and Lucy, and so he'll continue that piece while we're hiring, and we have posted that job position as well. We're starting to get applicants. So you are starting to get applicants. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this position will change. It's changed a lot since the beginning. I think that that's a big piece of this, is that the position um, really is around education and employment and gaining those two pieces. Um, it's not as much about social service, it's, it's really about working with people to um, gain employment. And um, there's a big technology piece to that because if you don't apply for jobs anymore in person, you know, it's, it's really rare to be able to walk into some place and just fill out an application. And so there's a lot of technology. And so we're really looking to hire someone who can really understand how to utilize trans technology and to train someone to utilize technology um, and uh, hopefully when we move to moving to work, we'll be able to really look at that program and, and see what other components we'd like to, to, you know, what waivers we could take to change that program as well. Certainly this, the importance of technology emphasizes the difference in ages of people you're working with too. Mm -hmm. I speak to myself as to Technological uh, an immigrant <laughs> program. Okay. The Housing Choice Voucher Program, Shelter Plus Care. So we've got the resident um, advisory and communications agenda. So that there's also in our packet, the newsletter for FSS participants, which I'm uh, hoping people will uh, enjoy the, the three interlocking circles of education, finances, and employment, as you were saying. It's a great poem. Yeah. The, um, let's look at the uh, Resident Advisory and Communications Committee. Yeah, I had a question. What is the bread shed? 
Uh, the bread shed was like a, it was like a shed that had been on the property that we used to, we used to have this program where people, we had a lot of bread donations. And so the food would go into the shed over time. It wasn't used as that anymore. And so it had been there a long time and it wasn't super, um, we found that it wasn't like it, it needed to be either replaced or repaired. And so it needed to, it needed to go. <laughs> I just got a kind of a kick out of it. The bread yeah, shed. I know. Yeah. We used to store food in it, and then and then we found people wouldn't get the food, and then it would rot. It became a whole other problem. And so, Moorcourt is like one of the. It's the only site where we don't have an open community room. You know, it's it's like people can, and they don't have laundry rooms. They have laundry in their own apartments, mm -hmm. and so it's the only site like that. And so there's really no place to put stuff for people to get. Okay. It's a great question. <laughs> War Court had a lot of uh, uh, comments. And of course, I guess the other ones had nobody in attendance. So the, the person took a full, full advantage of that time. Yes. Is there any way that at Moor Court, there could be a community room kind of like at Hayes that was more accessible or is that not? cost effective for us right now? I mean, would that involve, you know, I don't know much about how the whole complex is set up, you know, as to yeah, more where that has, might work. Yeah, we don't have any, I mean, we don't have any other space. We have that one, you know, the space that you've been in where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it looks like kind of like an art room and it's a small space. We don't have another space. So outside of building another, an additional building, we don't have that. It's the same at Ledgewood as well. Ledgewood has a very small area for mm -hmm. community space. When they developed the housing sites, they didn't develop community rooms. Hmm. Develop community rooms for aged and uh, disabled, but not for family sites. Mm -hmm. hmm. And so we've used apartments. Mm -hmm. You know, we've taken one apartment offline and we've utilized that for each site as a community room. Oh. <clears throat> How much are you used by residents as community rooms? Well, right now, not at all. But, you know, once COVID, when COVID wasn't in place, we use the community rooms at the family sites a lot. We use them for the summer meal programs. We have art programs. We have programs that happen at those sites. It's not like, you know, it's harder because we don't want kids just kind of hanging out by themselves in open spaces mm -hmm. alone. Um, and so we, they're locked, you know, until we have a program and we have things going on and then we have to have supervision. Yeah. Makes sense. It does indeed. And very important, both of the protection and the the people that it breaks to have it open. Okay. The pink, section eight, shelter plus care and transitions to housing. I have a question. I do not understand the difference between PBs, PBB, HCB, and TPV. <laughs> yeah, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Where's David? Um, so project-based vouchers are about, so PPV, PBV is a project-based voucher. Okay. And I'll ask him to put a little, um, I'll ask him to put a little thing on the bottom, an index. Okay. Thank you. And but check my memory or my understanding, a project-based voucher. It's a voucher that's specifically connected to the actual apartment itself. And not but right now, RAD has a voucher, you know, everyone that lives at our project at our RAD sites have a voucher that's connected to that specific unit. Mm -hmm. So if they move, they don't take the voucher with them as they would in a um, section eight. Yes, that would be a tenant based voucher. Mm -hmm. A tenant based voucher would be a voucher that they could apply to to then take with them. And so when David started this out, he said that we're able to provide, we're able to lease a project-based voucher to an applicant and an upper story this month. That means that he's able to offer a project, a voucher specifically to, um, 
to someone to move to one of the sites that doesn't have a voucher already in place, that doesn't have a, um, a voucher already for that unit. Well, the upper story is the residential area over the Brattleboro Co-op. Yes. Just define. Oh, okay. And the lease with the mainstream vouchers begin on May 1st? Yes, so we have some people, I think you'll remember that we applied for the mainstream vouchers specifically for some of our residents to, um, we had gotten these vouchers from HUD mm -hmm. and we, they were able to apply for this voucher and we were utilizing them. The board voted to have a preference so that you, so that they could come off of one of our programs where one of our homeless programs. So we had many residents who had been in either shelter plus care or primarily shelter plus care, but also transitions to housing, needing a, vo a, a voucher to go off that program. They didn't need the continued support of a case manager anymore. So they were just taking a spot that we could then move someone into the, one of those programs. So they moved from one of those programs with permanent support into a program that, without support because they've been independent for so long. And if you remember that voucher has specific guidelines, you have to be, you can't be, you have to be under a certain age and you have to be, um, you have to have someone in your household that is living with a disability. We were trying for a little bit more flexibility in the way we could house people. So I hope that works. Thank you, that helps. Yeah, and I'll ask him to add a little cheat index in the bottom. Thank you. Help my short-term memory. <laughs> no, it's not that at all. There are too many initials will make it difficult. And I thought baking was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Oh, dear. Um, the shelter plus care, 25 approved and searching, although 22 are housed and expect an additional two new applications from the coordinated entry. My understanding on coordinated entry is that all of the people who want the shelter plus care voucher go through Groundworks. Yes. So that there's one open, one doorway. Mm -hmm. Yes. Remember the MOU's memorandum of understanding from the sponsors? Yes. So the sponsors could be any organization, but they come through Groundworks. We work right now with Groundworks and HCRS. And as and David mentioned that we met with the Pathways, we met with them last week to see if they could also offer case management. Mm -hmm. And if I can back up, that's the difference but that you were talking about with the mainstream vouchers. People who don't need case management re meetings regularly would qualify for that opening more space and shelter plus care. Yes. But, but there's a real shortage of case management. Mm -hmm. And so we met with Pathways and they said that they might, they could probably support two people. Okay, good. Anything more on this? We have the monthly checklisting in green. I think the only thing to note on this, um, the checklisting was there was a amount to Chris Hart for three thousand five hundred and fifty six dollars. Mm -hmm. That was in regards to the fraud incident, so we reimbursed her for that amount. Mm -hmm. In the check signing assignment. We didn't seem to pay Green Mountain Power quite as much this time. We will next month. We'll make up for it. <laughs> well, when that solar array goes gets into 
uh, service, I hope that will make a change. I hope so too. Um, I, I'm out of town two weeks in July, in June. I could take July, but June would be a little hard. I'm, I'm around, so. Um, I can't do it until I'm fully vaccinated, my doctor says. Just gonna sure. this for one second. I just have to get up for a second. Okay, I'm listening. Or if somebody could take when I'm gone in June, that's fine. They could yeah. do that. I, oh. That would be helpful. Okay. Why don't you put me down for July? I mean, okay. And then um, we'll share June. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, hold on. So Donna was signed up for May, but that was before we sort of decided on that a while ago and I was going to bring them to you or, but it sounds like that won't work. So no, that will work as long as I don't have to go inside a building. No, I, I can drive them to you. And that's up to you. Or I could hopefully, you know, I should be able to leave the premises by July, I would hope. <laughs> so I don't well, know if someone, someone else wants to take May or not. If they can't, then we can work out a chauffeur kind of thing, like you said. And Alicia is not on the accounts yet. <laughs> so she will be. We just have to, we haven't signed her on yet. It's that's a process with the bank. Yeah. When we signed Donna on to May. I told her I would be the alternate for that. Oh. So I'm happy to do that. Okay. So and you I can take the first two weeks of June. Okay. I just can't take the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. So Janet try. will do May. Mm -hmm. Let me try to do the, let's see, I, I get my shot Wednesday and then what is it, three weeks after that? Mm -hmm. And then another two weeks after that? You know, it's two weeks after the second shot. Yep. So would I be all set for June? Would that make sense? July is, I think, what we need because Byron and Liz are going to do June. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll take July then. Yeah. So Byron, can you do the last two weeks of June? Yes. And I'll do the first two weeks of June. Okay. Great. Good. And I've already worked out with... Uh, uh, people there that uh, I'm going to do the 30th of April. So mm -hmm. happy to do that. Christine, did you find somebody for this Friday? Yes. Janet Kramer is going to do this Friday. Great. Thank you. So we are at fiscal budget review and the board review of proposed budget for um, April 2021. Ooh. I think there may be a uh, type on here. I just on the uh, fiscal budget review of proposed budget for 4 1 2021 to 3 31 2021. And James is here as well. Hi, James. Welcome. Sorry that. Thank you for being on. <laughs> Hello, James. And so I, I took out two pieces of this that I, you know, under, um, for the salaries, I put that in your confidential piece. So that's what we will be discussing during executive session. So when we're ready to go into executive session, let me know. Well, what I'm looking at is the fact that it's the review of the budget to 331 2022, not 2021 on the agenda. Oh. I'm sorry. Well, I'm just wanting to make sure I was reading it correctly. and <laughs> I missed it when I reviewed before. Oh, let me see. Okay. It's the, yep, it's the proposed budget ending on 331, 2021. Oh, 22, right, 22, sorry. I was puzzling. <laughs> Thank you. James, will you lead us through this, please? Um, sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. So I'm assuming 
Christine gave everyone a copy of the budget. So the first page of the budget is just all the programs you currently operate. Mm -hmm. And what the projected revenue and projected expenses for each program are. Great. Um, the only comment, well, I mean, if anyone has any comments, there's plenty of things we can discuss. The only thing I wanted to point out, and I'm sure you were all aware of, and I'm sure Christine, Christine and I have discussed it is, there's a line here for replacement reserves about three quarters of the way down. And under the AWR column, it's blank. Mm -hmm. And that's because the program cannot afford to fund a replacement reserve at the current moment. Mm. Overall, the overall the year to year comparative on the right hand side is pretty um, consistent from year to year. Uh, revenues are consistent. Expenses, for the most part, are consistent, except for we've seen some increase in in relations to the insurance costs, and we also have a large increase in maintenance salaries. And due to the fact that when the 2021 budget was designed, it was missing the maintenance supervisor, which Christine has now have on the budget. So between that and added uh, raises, that has increased the maintenance line item for salaries, almost $100,000. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the Are there any comments on the first page? No. Any questions, concerns? Well, I'm delighted to see that it still projects us in the black. Right. It does. Projections being, again, being based on um, rental charges are rental charges. So that's not the issue. The issue, of course, as we know, is collection of the rent. Yes. So that's a cash issue more than a net income line item issue. And for the most part, none of the other revenue here is contingent on anything besides HUD's funding of Section 8. And as we know, they're going to fund Section 8 the current year 20. They're going to fund calendar year 2022 based on your actual expenses for 2021. So we should be good on that end. So I don't see revenue being an issue for the Housing Authority this year in terms of making budget expenses. As we know, that's the only area where the budget could have some problems compared to actuals that we spend more than we project. So subsequent pages are just pages that design how we got the mm -hmm. first page. Like page two is the process in which we are charging fees to all our properties, whether they're RAD programs, AWR, RCC, and future RCC2 for overhead related to the administration of programs and the maintenance itself. The programs either pay based on a unit basis or they're paying on a bedroom basis, their share of the overhead expenses. Are the lines for non-routine expenses blank because they're totally unpredictable? Um, they're blank because they're unpredictable and, well, we could budget for them if you'd like, but they're also blank because the bottom lines were so tight. I mean, if we run into something, we want to budget for something in the future, we can. But I don't have anything in the budget at this current year because I'm trying to make sure that the bottom lines stay positive. But if something comes up, that doesn't mean we can't do it. It just means that nothing's been budgeted. If there's something the board would like to budget in the future. It's something they should discuss with Christine and we'll see if we can work it into the budget. Okay. But at this current moment, there's nothing there just based on current economics. I know thinking back to A.W. Richards, the, the heating in that building used a lot, I mean, made it very difficult. 
and made some money. Yeah, we, we so we really need to work with Evernorth on restructuring the way A.W. Richards works. It doesn't, it's never, you know, I think anyone, I think many of you have been on the board for several years. This is not, this issue is a long standing concern that A.W. Richards, we don't pay ourselves from it. We're basically managing it for free. It doesn't, you know, it's a really, it's a tough property for sure. Um, and so, in that I think that's a discussion the board needs to have. I hope that that can come out in our strategic planning process as well as you know how we want to work with Evernorth to to come up with a plan to really be able to be able to put money more money into reserves and to to work with the property. But right now the way it's structured, there really isn't any flexibility for that. I mean the I, budget I just so you're aware, um, you know, in Chris's development piece, I've tasked her with taking on that as a project once we get through RCC, but that would be her next feat job is in working at development is helping to have those conversations with Evernorth. Good. I mean, the budget that we have currently here does have AWR with management and maintenance fees budgeted to be paid to the housing authority in the current year. Again, like Christine just said, though, that'll come. They're budgeted. We're expected to collect them. They're part of what makes our budget balance. But if something comes up where, like we just discussed, the heating or this or that, and they don't have the funds, again, that comes down to funds more than we'll charge them for it, just whether or not we'll be able to collect them for it. As I'm sure the board's aware, we have a large receivable from AWR from prior years' management fees that have never been collected. And mm -hmm. hopefully, we don't have that in the future. But this budget projects that we'll charge them and they'll pay it and we'll see what happens. Yes. Um, so the next, the next page again is just a supplemental schedule of how administrative expenses are expected to be paid and what they're being paid for. Um, as we're all aware, this budget is expecting that the public housing program will disappear Effective August, I believe it is. Is that correct, Christine? Yes. So the Melrose column or public housing will disappear as of August, and then all the expenses for the most part will be picked up by the RAD programs, Section 8, and then what we charge for fees to the tax credit properties. And then the fourth schedule is the one I'm sure. Christine was talking about this is the projected salaries for each position as this budget has it. So I think that's the piece that I've taken out of this first packet and I, I put that into um, when, which going for our uh, executive session. And so we can enter into executive session if you want to at this point. Are there any more questions on the um, draft budget? No. Sure. Is there a that has been an issue for us in the past? The, the uh, estimates for health insurance. They're planning an inflation of five percent. That. That is the, those are the current costs as they are now with the 5% inflation back to correct. I mean, this is the sixth piece that we have. And then water and sewer for all of the properties. Correct. And electric. Yep, just estimates based on current spending patterns and historical data. Mm -hmm. um, the next schedule is your schedule of rental, a schedule of revenues based on current rent rolls mm -hmm. and your current Section 8 program. As I'm sure you're aware, or maybe Christine hasn't told you, this budget has Section 8 prorated at 80% for admin fee. I just published that 82% would be the amount for the next six months to the end of the year or seven months. So the budget's actually light. We'll actually make a few more dollars on every unit we lease. Wonderful. 
Uh, the left, ninth page is your maintenance materials and contract costs yes. um, for each project. Again, this is based on current spending patterns and historical data with some inflation adjustments added. Okay. And then the page that was asked about before non-routine, it is blank. Again, like I said, just due to the current situation with the budget. But in the future, if there's anything the board would like to place in that section, this is what the schedule is for. We can easily add that to the budget and see how it works. This is equipment replacements and, and betterments. I, I love that word, betterments and additions. For, you know, vehicles, any new vehicles we need, anything of that. I mean, for the most part, it would most, most likely be vehicles. Um, and then if we did any large building improvements, it would go on here. Okay. Very good. So I think we are at the point where I need a motion from the board to enter executive session. So moved. Okay, second. I'll second it. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so. I'm flexible. <laughs> I can build in anything with enough time, you know, if I have, um, you know. And our next task is to accept the 2021-2022 Brattleboro Housing Partnership budget. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Thank you, Byron. Any discussion? No. All those any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? We have a budget. Great, thank you. Thank you. And I will mark Liz's vote as absentee. Yes, she, she confirmed it before she, she left. And the large projects in progress. Yeah. Everyone, I'm going to have to leave. <clears throat> I have a family member showing up. He's three years old, and today is his birthday. Oh, of course. Well, thank you for sharing with us. I know that's a big deal. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Donna. And and there isn't that much left to report. So I will do it briefly, but I'll put it in the notes so you have it. I'll try to get the notes okay. done, and I'll mail. I'll put them out. Okay. Right I'll send thank those you back to everyone. Down. Happy. This is grandson. Okay. So, um, so Chris did not send me a report. However, I've been really closely working with her um, on Red Clover 2. And so we are still on target for completion um, for July. We will not begin to house until August. Um, we'll be housing August, September, August and September. Um, and maybe part of July, but um, but we're really we're really everything looks to be working on target. I, I went over the construction of what was going on at RCC. It was massive construction. I mean, that's probably the biggest disruption they will have. It was a lot, I and mean, we had to shut the road down. It was it was a lot for sure, um, and it's very disruptive for residents, and I'm sure very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate everything that they've done. I swear we will have a party for them. <laughs> when this is all over, um, but I definitely understand. And they have been so patient. So, um, but, but we're working on that. We're also working on just making sure that the garage is a little safer. You know, it's really dark in the garage. So we want to add some lighting, some area to walk through. Um, so we're working on that right now. I'm going to do a walkthrough with the architects and the construction crew on Thursday. And so we'll have a better understanding of, of what that's going to look like, because we really think that a lot of the people from RCC too, well, because they'll be entering the garage to get their cars, that they'll probably use the garage as a walkthrough. That's what I was wondering. So that yeah. from RCC2 to RC1, RCC1, the garage would be a pass-through because we tried to talk about a bridge there and then couldn't afford yeah. to build that. And so I think we need to make it as safe as possible. I think we need to know, we need to have the expectation that people are going to do that. And so we need to make it as safe as possible. And so we'll be working on that. Okay. Um, 
Any questions about that, RCC2? Okay. Um, Melrose PNMA is really on target the same as it was last month. So we're really finishing the design this month. The permitting will be starting this month as well. We've already started with the initial permitting. Um, we're putting it out to bid in June. The construction will begin in August to November. And then post-construction will be the whole a year from November to the following October. And Jack was able, we had to do a lot of procurement for this. And so one of the things that I've asked him to do before he left was making sure that all the procurement was in order when he leaves. So, so when he decided that to give his, um, to resign from his position, I asked him to specifically work on a few projects and this was one of them. And the moving to work, also known as Brattleboro Housing Opportunities. Um, the and so that's, we're going to, um, that will stay on the agenda, but nothing has changed since the last time we met. I don't know if um, people have had an opportunity to look at that web. There was a um, YouTube video about the ACC amendment. So I can, I can send that out again. I'll, I can do that on the next, but I knew that we would be really working on the budget today. So nothing is really changing right now. I figured you will vote on it either in June or in, um, July, I think we take August off. So. so it's important to, to get it done in July. Yep, okay. Okay, we are at the point of adjournment. Okay. All the, I mean, I need a motion to adjourn. I move. I move. Thank you. And Byron is going to second it. Wonderful, thank you. Please say, all those over, please say aye. And thank you all for some good hard work today. Yes, it was a lot. Thank you. A lot to go over.